If you could uninvent any past invention, what would you uninvent and why? Ladies and gentlemen, that question is what brought me here today. I'd like to take you back about four months to November 29th, 2018 to be exact. I had the opportunity to deliver an opening keynote presentation to a group of about 150 business leaders. One of the topics that I chose to integrate into my presentation was the importance of psychological safety in the workplace and how when it exists, it is one of the most critical key ingredients that leads to consistent, high-performing teams. Now, as a way to further introduce the topic, I asked the audience to pick a partner, and specifically someone they didn't know. And I gave each of them four questions to ask one another. Now, these weren't your typical networking style questions. These were questions that were designed in a way to hopefully fast track the connection and relationship building process between two people. And of course, my hope was is that it would begin to shine a light on what psychological safety between two human beings feels like. The last of the four questions that I had them ask each other was, if you could uninvent any past invention, what would you uninvent and why? Now, after about 10, 15 minutes, I gathered the groups back together and I began engaging partners to find out what they had learned about each other. When I was chatting with the first group and they were sharing their answers with me, I was very surprised that both of them actually said that the invention they would uninvent is the smartphone. I then went to the second group and both of them again said the smartphone. I then approached the third group and again, to my surprise, both of them said smartphone. Then, out of the far corner of the room, a gentleman stood up and with a loud, booming voice said, I just have to ask, by a show of hands, how many of you also said smartphone? What happened next blew me away. Almost every hand in the room went up. Now, I am not a market research professional, but I knew in that moment I had accidentally stumbled upon a really amazing discovery. Why the smartphone? Now, you're probably wondering how they answered the why they chose to uninvent the smartphone. But before I actually get to that, I have to share with you some of the amazing positive impacts that the smartphone has delivered to all of us. And I wanna look at it and share with you from two different perspectives. One, from a global or a macro perspective, and two, from an individual or a micro perspective. Starting with global, from a pure economic impact, the smartphone and mobile industry last year alone contributed 3.6 trillion, with a T, trillion dollars to the world's GDP. Now, I've never had $3.6 trillion, so I don't know what that looks like, and I needed a frame of reference of really how much is that. So the frame of reference I chose was a Tesla. A brand new Model 3 has a starting price of $35,000. That means that the smartphone and mobile industry last year contributed the equivalent of 103 million brand new Tesla Model 3s. Pretty impressive. Now, the smartphone wasn't responsible for that number alone. If you think about as the smartphone has exploded, this cottage ecosystem of businesses that have spawned to support its growth. Case and screen protectors, earphones and earbuds and apps and more apps and countless different styles of companies that make chargers and adapters. I mean, how boring would life be if our daily lexicon had not been expanded with new made up words like dongle and pop socket? And what's also amazing about all of this new cottage industry is the number of jobs that have been created, 29 million to be exact. Now, Amazon, a company I think every one of us in this room is familiar with, has roughly 613,000 employees globally. That means that the smartphone and mobile industry has contributed the equivalent of 47 companies 
the size of Amazon. It's an important job creation number. Now, from an individual perspective, there's a lot of impact that the phone has delivered, the smartphone has delivered to us, but I want to focus in on two, and in two areas. One is education, and the other is convenience. Nelson Mandela once said that education is the greatest weapon that you can use to change the world. And I think we'd all agree that we carry around in our pockets access to more information and education than in any other time in human history. And as Henry Rollins, the famous vocalist and poet, once said, there is no longer an excuse for stupidity. <laughs> this device also has created uh, what researchers and scientists refer to as cognitive offloading. What that means simply is that we no longer need to hold space in our brain for information that can be easily stored and retrieved when we need it. And I'll give you a quick example. And um, I don't know if I should be proud or embarrassed to admit this, but I'm going to. Two of the three most important people in my life, my two daughters, one is 14, the other is 12, both have smartphones. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know either one of their phone numbers. <laughs> I don't need to. Now, from a convenience standpoint, I think I can sum it up quite simply. Alarm clocks, calendars, address books, maps, cameras, all of these devices at one time we used to have to purchase and use separately. And they've all been conveniently consolidated into this elegant, brilliant device. So, with all of the impacts that have been created both at a global level and an individual level, why the heck would 150 business leaders almost unanimously say that the one invention they would uninvent is the smartphone? Well, their answer could be best summarized with the erosion of real human connection. Over the last decade or so, there have been countless studies and surveys globally wanting to find out what has been the biggest impact of the smartphone. And study after study, the answer almost always comes back that our phones have actually brought us closer to our friends and family. Quick example, just this week I received a notification on my phone letting me know that it was one of my friend's birthdays. How convenient, because I would have forgotten otherwise. So I sent them a social media post, I sent them a text message wishing them a happy birthday. But as I reflect on that, and if I'm honest with myself, is wishing a friend of mine, somebody I care about, a happy birthday through a social media post and a text message, an example of real human connection? It begs the question for me, have our smartphones somehow, and perhaps unintentionally, found a way to become a surrogate for real human connection? And if so, how the heck did that happen? Well, the answer in part lies in neuroscience. Dopamine, which is one of the brain's neurotransmitters, helps regulate things like our movement, our attention, our learning, and our emotional responses. Another important factor that dopamine is responsible for is helping us recognize when we see a potential reward. And even more powerful, it helps us move towards achieving that reward. And if you think about this recognition of potential rewards and our desire to achieve them, we check into our phones and it buzzes and it beeps and it dings and the likes and the shares and this instant sense of gratification we get gives us this massive dopamine rush. In fact, a recent University of Maryland study has concluded that the dopamine rush we get from checking in with our phones is just like the dopamine rush someone would get from snorting a line of cocaine. Our phones have found a way to hijack our neural programming, and the audience I was with clearly felt a fear that it's pulling us away from real human connection. Robert Waldinger, he's a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst, and he is the current director 
of the Harvard Study of Adult Development. Now, this study has been going on for about 75 years, and it's been studying the lives of 724 men. And the study has had one goal. It wants to answer the question, what makes for a happy life? Year in, year out, the study has pointed to one very simple, yet very powerful conclusion. Good relationships. And I think we'd all agree, at the core of every good relationship is real human connection. In the four months that have transpired since that keynote presentation where I accidentally stumbled into this discovery, I've instituted a very simple, what I'll simply call a connection practice. I've come up with a list of thought-provoking, fun, and engaging questions that I can use to engage someone in a conversation. Let me just give you a few examples of the questions. What's your favorite family heirloom? What one vacation destination are you most excited to visit? If you were alone on a deserted island for a couple of weeks, what one album would you take with you? And if I really want to go deep with someone, what's one lesson life is trying to teach you right now? Questions like this, when I ask them, it opens up a world of possibilities. It lets me know who someone is, what they stand for, what they value. And the most wonderful unintended positive consequence is it keeps me from grabbing my phone for the instant dopamine rush. And these questions can work in just about any circumstance. I'd like to give you two examples. About a month ago, I was in Dallas, Texas. And I was attending the second of five in-person classes connected to an annual leadership program that I'm currently enrolled in. Well, the night before class, a group of my classmates and I got together for a private dinner. And about halfway through the dinner, there was a little bit of a lull in the conversation, and so I decided to be courageous and jump in and, and ask the entire group, what's your favorite family heirloom? The ensuing 90 minutes of conversation was like watching a pinball bounce around a pinball machine. We were so engaged in what everyone's favorite family heirloom was, where it had come from, who gave it to them, what was the significance. And mind you, this is a group of relative strangers. This is only our second time together. And at no time during this 90-minute conversation did anybody reach for their phone. It was magical. Let me give you the, another quick example. Family dinners. If your family dinners are anything like mine, it takes but a second to get distracted by your smartphone. So at the Moore household, we've instituted a no phone rule at the dinner table. Now that could be dinner in the house or it could be dinner out. We've actually taken it a step further. We've purchased conversation starter games, these cute little boxes of cards with questions on them. It sits in the middle of the table, and we simply go around, pull a card out, and ask a question, and engage each other as family members. It's pretty magical. And instead of eating and making eye contact with our phones, we're eating and making eye contact with the people we love most. What a novel idea. I'd like to begin to wrap up with a quote that uh, I heard uh, not too terribly long ago, but it has had such a profound impact in my life, and I want to share it with all of you. And the quote is this, with increased awareness comes more choice. With increased awareness comes more choice. Our world is moving faster and faster, and technology is penetrating every single part of the human experience. And we are reaping massive positive rewards from it. At the same time, I think it's incumbent upon every one of us to fight the dopamine rush we get from connecting with our technology, to fight the sense of autopilot because it's so easy to slip into our routines and go through life just obeying our normal patterns. We need to carve out time to practice engaging with one another. Every one of you in this room could come up with two or three questions that can be your questions. And if coming up with thought-provoking, engaging questions isn't your cup of tea, you can pull out your smartphone just this one time <laughs> and Google a few questions and make them your own. 
Because as we hurdle through this unpredictable, crazy, exciting world, the one thing that actually separates us from our technology is our humanness. And the best way to capitalize on our humanness is to make time and consciously practice real human connection. Thank you.